and thank you for welcoming me to the floor. Last week, I'll confess, I lost my voice and I've been trying to be very careful. If at some point I start randomly squeaking, squeaking, wow, squeaking, it's hopefully puberty hitting in. <coughs> no. Um, that's the only picture of a spider in here. I was advised to remove the spiders and use something else, so if anyone's uncomfortable, <laughs> that's the only one you have to suffer. And look how cute it is, it's wonderful. <laughs> but yes, captive breeding of animals. So I'm not going to, not going to do so much into the, the ethics around this, more the methods and the positive and negative outcomes. Conservation breeding, uh, captive breeding. But a little bit about me to start with. So that's me. This format has changed slightly, but we'll go with it. I'm Andrew, and if you hide this bit, that's my last name. But if you include the last bit, you can find me basically everywhere on the internet. You can do that right now. You can try it. So, I like to consider myself a scientist. There I am wearing a weird reference t-shirt with spiders on it. A lab coat with messy hair, so I, I think it counts, but that's what I do more often. Oh, so. Great. I, I do field work. I prefer the field work side of ecology and conservation. So that's me holding the uh, white Arctic fox cub. So this young female was one of 11 cubs that we caught up over the summer, my little team over a period of few days. And she's the one who managed to bite me, just on the inside of the watch. <laughs> this doesn't mean that I'm qualified to tell you about this, but it does show that yeah, I do this occasionally. And this topic I'm talking about, captive breeding, is something that I've looked at a few times over my career. But let's crack on, shall we? Today, pandas, we're going to look at the uses of captive breeding. Um, what is conservation breeding? And you see the subtle word change there. This is about the conservation side. But we'll look at everything else briefly. I've got two case studies to look at. The method section, the positive and negative outcomes of this, they're all going to kind of be wrapped up into the stories, the case studies, but we'll try and like clarify and pull everything together at the end. And we'll do a little talk about in situ, ex situ conservation efforts that will all become clear. <coughs> so the uses of captive breeding, let's just put these up very quickly. Commercial purposes, pets, food, medicines, anything which humans can use, anything where we can make money. I do this. I have spiders which I'm breeding <laughs> to sell. So yeah, that's, yeah, that's, ca that's captive breeding. <laughs> Are you ashamed? Yes. Um, your sheep, your goats, your goldfish, your dogs, everything falls under this category. And in most of the world, most of the developed world, this is very well controlled, very ethically done with a lot of management and regime to control it. And it comes into conflict with this in occasion. So that's conservation, which is what we're going to be talking about today. The one in the middle, zoos, aquariums, and research institutes. The research institutes are the people who are using animals for testing. An entirely different kettle of fish. I said the animal ethics, very complicated, very big, very big discussion. But the zoos and the conservation, they work quite closely. Zoos are one of the primary structures, one of the main structures for doing conservation breeding. Put up one debate point here, which is not so much of a normal debate, but more of a concern within the industry. Should there be a separation of animals between conservation and commercial breeding? The story of this is there are people who are breeding for conservation, the tiger specifically, and they say it's for conservation, but they're actually harvesting for medicines. So they do, they're saying this and getting funding for this, and then making money up here. What this does is this causes a conflict. It makes it creates a supply of the product, in this case, tiger parts, teeth and bones, which makes the wild animals that much more at risk. So it's actually negatively affecting conservation. So the question could be, should we just commercialize everything, you know, commercialize the tiger, use 90% of them, and then the excess, extra 10% use them for conservation, make conservation a sideline business for commercial profit? This will all wrap up later, hopefully, because funding is going to be a consistent theme. What is conservation breeding? So there's a few different methods and mechanisms that come into this, monitoring a population. First of all, you have to realize the population is declining. The two case studies later, we'll talk about why species decline. But often enough, it's actually just people not paying enough attention. We see something, 
is declining or it has declined by a long way and you go damn we're about to lose them and you just grab them and put them into captivity you're collecting specimens to breed the third point on there is learn about the animal which kind of seems in the wrong place you know to learn about it after collecting it as say by the time you've noticed something's declining enough to start captive breeding unless you've got a good monitoring program in place normally you have to react quite fast to collect so you learn afterwards the initial stages of conservation breeding are often very unsuccessful main aspect is collecting genetic material because even if an animal itself is dead if you have its sperm and its eggs you can make more animals you know, that's now doable within science and the main aim of conservation breeding or conservation yeah captive breeding is to release specimens back into the wild to try and bolster natural populations so that's the aims and kind of what is more generally so the black-footed ferret one of my favorites <laughs> Look at that little bandit mask and the little pointy ears and sharp teeth. Look. Black mask, legs and tip of tail, everything else is brown. Kind of like a weird hot dog and spends most of its time underground hunting these guys. So this is the black tailed prairie dog. There are three varieties of prairie dog in North America. For this we're just going to refer to the prairie dog. This is the main one, the black tail. These black footed ferrets were declared extinct in 1970, roughly about the 1970s. What had happened was they hunt and spend their entire life relying entirely on the prairie dog. The prairie dog makes up 90 odd percent of their diet. The black-footed ferrets live in their burrows, they breed in their burrows, they raise their young in the prairie dog burrows, in the prairie dog towns we call it. Farmers had come in and started plowing up the prairie grasslands for crops. And they started putting pipes underground and blasting poisonous gas into prairie towns because they were trying to graze the land and they thought the prairie dog and the cattle would compete for grasses. So they were wiping out the prairie dog to make better agricultural land. So we have one captive bred animal, cows, agricultural, making profit, you know, commercial versus conservation right here. The black-footed ferret started declining, and the problem is when you start plowing up land, breaking habitats like that, the individuals themselves will die, so you'll lose some individuals, you have less. It's then less easy for them to move around, they can't find each other, so they become disconnected. And at this point, breeding becomes very difficult. If you can't find a mate, because there's not enough of them, and they're a long way away, you're not likely to have successful breeding. And that's all decline is. Decline is when your death rate overtakes your birth rate. That's what happened. And this wasn't going to kill the black-footed ferret. This alone, removing the prairie dog in the large swaths and areas that they did, wasn't going to kill the prairie dog. A second problem came in in the form of sylvatic plague and canine distemper, a disease that came in and just slapped them until they fell over and stopped moving. They were declared extinct in 1970. They found one last population in Wyoming, Ontario, in 1978. And they debated at that time. They couldn't decide, do we leave them here in the wild, in their habitat, and try and conserve them and protect them here? Or do we take them into captivity and breed them and protect them there? Whilst they were debating, whilst they were taking too long to decide, the Sylvatic Plague came back. 22 ferrets. That was what was left. They caught 22 ferrets. Of those, 18 managed to make it to the rescue center and survived. Of those 18 ferrets, there are seven unique genetic lines. This is the only population of this in the world. This animal doesn't exist anywhere else. So this animal is now limited to seven genetic lines for eternity until, I won't go into the biology of random selection and mutations and gaining genetics that way, but seven genetic lines because they were too busy arguing as to what to do that's one of the arguments in situ in the situation in the environment in the habitat ex situ remove in an external environment they had this argument as it is they took those seven genetic lines those 18 ferrets made some complicated algorithms and kind of worked out how to best breed everyone together to not have inbred populations they now produce over 200 ferrets a year and they've also been contacting farmers and letting farmers and paying farmers to keep the habitat for the prairie dog. We are now releasing black-footed ferrets. It's a very, very successful project. But we had two factors that caused the decline. 
a delay in a decision making, and now we're very limited genetically. But it is a success story in the end. Oh, that's them. So this is one of the boxes they're kept in when they're breeding. It's a large box. They probably have, yeah, they have boxes, and that's a mother with her cubs. Uh, they're fed live animals um, to try and make sure they maintain the habitat of uh, the habit of hunting because they're to be released for the wild. So again, this is one of those ethical questions of feeding live prey in a captive environment. Messy, but moving on, because I'm aware of the time. Colorbury frog. It's colorful, it's toxic. Yes, it's from Australia. <laughs> it's corroboree. Corroboree. Yeah. <laughs> yes, okay, corroboree. <laughs> so all amphibians worldwide are dying. There's this one fungus, this one plague called the chitrin. I can't, I won't spell it for you, I will get it wrong. Which is basically, it's a fungus that lives in the water and amphibians transfer it through sitting in the same water, bodies, or by direct contact. It gets under the skin and basically removes the skin from the amphibians and calcifies them. Gross. Anyway, these guys, they live at the top of Australia's highest mountain and they're iconic in that sense that, you know, they're small, that's a finger they're on, they're small, colourful, noisy, and of this unique habitat. <coughs> so people are making an effort to save them. They have this tank here, and that, it's a terrible picture, that tank will hold many individuals, and because these are small, you can be very successful with the breeding. And they are now releasing these frogs into controlled habitats where they know amphibians are going in and out, so there's no risk of disease. Two examples of conservation breeding, both have been successful. <laughs> I kind of scuppered myself here by putting great for research and education under the positives because that kind of covers a lot of the benefits without me having so many points. So it looks bad, but for the most part, we can consider captive breeding to be successful. Though it does mostly work for charismatic species. I pulled out the frog and the, the spider, which I didn't use, the lady bear spider, because they're not the sort of things people often think about. Large conservation projects are the American condor, the red maned wolf, the black footed ferret. Large mammals are common. So it's not so easy to find people protecting and serving the little guys. You only have to look at the 2017 report Insect Armageddon to know we're losing about 70% of our invertebrate populations. Things are dying. And invertebrates are small, they're easy to take care of. As I say, I've got spiders, I've had beetles. Insects generally if you can manage the habitat, are easy to work with. But we don't. The funding goes into charismatic species. This is a problem. Difficult to do cephalopods, uh, squids, octopus, cuttlefish, anything with tentacles, basically. Really, really, really difficult to get to breed in captivity. And really suffering with changing water temperatures, changing acidities of waters. Expensive, and the in-situ work. So we couldn't have the black-footed program, black-footed ferret program, if we couldn't release them, we'd just end up with loads of animals sat in a pen waiting to get out, but there'd be nowhere to put them. So it, I don't know if this is a negative or if it should sit in the middle, but with captive breeding being expensive, you have to set up facilities, you have to have staff. You also need to work in the environment. Sorry, yeah, I didn't see your hand. Do you know the total cost for the, the prairie dog the project to save it? How much is this? Just to get that. No. Uh, so the, the, the Black-Footed Project is broken into a few different departments. The Black-Footed Conservation, the Habitat Management, and the Agricultural Development, changing the agricultural system. And I don't know the cost of any of them. I don't know how much they've spent. Animal behavior, that's the last point I was trying to make with the Black-Footed Ferret. You have to maintain their behavior, their ability to eat and hunt and all these things. But, we do protect all species. And it's good for research. There's not many times or many opportunities you have where you can get hold of something like a condor or a wolf or a ferret and look at it genetically, look at it on a very minute biological level, looking at the toxicology and what diseases kill it and how it's working. I'm running out of time, so I'll start to wrap it up. But the black-footed, the ferrets in Europe are resistant and immune to, I think it's the sylvatic plague. 
So they're trying to splice the genome from the European ferret with the black-footed ferret to make them naturally resistant. At the moment, they're kind of throwing uh, vaccine-laced M&Ms at them, and that seems to be working. In shoe versus exit shoe. So, is there? Yes, good. Um, which should have a priority of funding? In situ, where you're managing the habitat. If you're managing the habitat, you manage everything in the habitat. But if you're just looking at levels of control and how easy is it to control climate, your success levels with in situ conservation can be very low. But your success levels with ex situ are likely to be higher, are often shown to be higher, but it's that much more expensive and that much narrower. So three points, just in case anyone was interested in these things. Should we be funding the panda? Because the pandas aren't being released and they're kind of just there to be cute. That's more of a fun topic to raise up with school kids. They like that one. And then the same two points that I raised up earlier, just so everyone can see. And that concludes.